All right. Well, welcome everyone to our September virtual Drupal NYC meetup. Uh, good to have you all here. Um, lots of uh, familiar faces and some new ones as well. So uh, welcome to everybody. Um, we're going to hop into the presentation here. OK, so uh -oh, what's it doing? <laughs> here we go. OK, so a few housekeeping notes. Um, so we encourage you to turn on your video camera if you're game to you know, try to maintain our sense of community. It's good to, to see everyone that uh, you know, we used to and we will see in person at some point. Um, and of course, mute yourself when you're not speaking. And um, you know, unless, unless the speakers say otherwise, feel free to politely interrupt uh, the speakers uh, with any questions you have. Uh, we can make it interactive uh, as long as the, our speakers are game. Um, and you, you might have heard earlier, uh, please don't use the text chat feature in Google Meet here, um, but rather hop on Drupal NYC Slack uh, in the Meetup channel. That's where we're going to just discuss things uh, you know, during the, uh, the talks and before and after tonight. Um, yeah, and also uh, uh, that's where we're going to introduce ourselves in a minute. So uh, if you're not on Slack already, uh, you can hop on over to drupalnyc.org slash Slack. And that has a, a magical link to join. Um, and you can join on the web, or you can download the app. It's real easy. OK, so coming soon, a little uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to hear uh, from Oliver Davies uh, all the way in the UK about uh, upgrading your site to Drupal 9. Uh, and then Michael Schmidt is going to talk about my best and worst strategies for dealing with high demand work. And uh, here are the organizers for today's meetup. Um, and uh, you know everything we do is based off of the work of past organizers and the Drupal NYC board. Uh, and if you are interested in participating as uh, an organizer for the meetup, uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, just hop on Slack and join the meetup-organize channel, and uh, we'll get you set up. Uh, so we're on Twitter, Drupal NYC. And, uh, and there's the Slack link again. Hashtag Drupal NYC for all you social media fiends. Uh, and we always encourage everyone to support the Drupal Association. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know, uh, the DA is a nonprofit um, that helps provide a lot of the infrastructure uh, and uh, you know, both technical and community um, for the Drupal Open Source Project and all the contributed modules and testing and all sorts of other great stuff they put on the uh, the big DrupalCon conferences uh, a couple times a year. Um, so they do a lot, and uh, you can become a member. Um, it doesn't cost very much, and it's a, a great kind of token of appreciation, and it really allows them to, to do all their good work. OK, a bunch of upcoming events. Uh, these are all virtual. <laughs> no surprise there. Uh, so Drupal Camp Atlanta, uh, September 10 to 12. Uh, Flyover Camp, uh, which is uh, typically in Kansas, I think. Uh, September 17 to 18. Is it Kansas? I think it's Kansas this year. There's going to be. Uh, Baltimore Drupal Camp, uh, September 25th. Uh, Bay Area Drupal Camp, October 14 to 17. And of course, Drupal Camp NYC 2020, uh, November 13 and 14. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next slide. Uh, and DrupalCon Europe, formerly DrupalCon Barcelona, uh, will be December 8 to 11. So Drupal Camp NYC 2020. Um, so it's going to be online virtual conference. And this is on a Friday and a Saturday, November 13 to 14. Friday, we're going to have sessions, boffs, and fun interactive activities uh, as a little break from the uh, perhaps monotony of uh, online <laughs> virtual conferences and stuff like that. Uh, and then Saturday, we're going to have trainings and uh, contribution day. Um, so if you're interested in getting involved, uh, here are some emails email addresses you can uh, get in touch with, and uh, we'll, we'll get you pointed to the right person. Um, and you can learn more at 2020.drupalcamp.nyc, and on Twitter, at DrupalCampNYC. Um, so if you're interested in speaking at uh, one of our Drupal NYC meetups, which we have, uh, typically it's the first Wednesday of the month, um, you can get in touch with an organizer directly, or I recommend you email speak at drupalnyc.org, and we'll uh, we'll get back to you and get you on the schedule. 
Um, and you can talk about anything, you know, potentially relevant or of interest to somebody who is learning Drupal or uses Drupal or hates Drupal. Uh, whatever, whatever floats your boat, we want to we wanna hear from you. OK, so I think we've got um, few enough people on the call we can actually do this. <laughs> so get ready to unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself if you are hiring. Um, let's do hiring first. So if you're a company or, or maybe you as an individual uh, are hiring somebody to do something uh, Drupal-y or somewhat Drupal-y, now's your opportunity to shout from the rooftops. Anyone? Going once. Going twice. Okay. Nobody's hiring. <laughs> um, but... Uh, is anybody looking to be hired? Maybe uh, maybe the hiring people are just shy, and uh, <laughs> and they need you to, to, to speak up. Anybody out there looking for a job? Yep, this is Ian, Ian Finley, looking for Drupal work, back-end work. Uh, I've been out of the Drupal scene for a couple of years, getting back into it. I like migrations, and moving stuff around on the cloud. That's me. Hire me, please. <laughs> Anyone else out there? Okay. Niraj, do you want to take over? We'll, we'll continue on. Okay. So, introduction. So now is a great opportunity to hop over to Slack and write up a little note. Take a minute. Say who you are, why you're here, maybe, um, what your favorite color is, and uh, uh, hopefully some of those conversations can uh, continue after the meetup. So, you know, you know, stop talking for a minute and let, let everyone post in uh, the meetup channel. All right, 10 more seconds for your, your introductions. On our first uh, virtual meetup, we, we went around the room and had everyone do it in person here. It didn't work very well. <laughs> too many people, too many people muted. Okay. Well, without further ado, um, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Oliver Davies, upgrading your site to Drupal 9. Oliver, are you there and ready to go? All right. There he is. So I'm going to stop presenting here and turn it over to Oliver.
maybe while uh, while he's getting his uh, presentation casting as he wants, um, does anybody have any questions off the top of their head they have about upgrading to Drupal 9 that um, perhaps he or someone else can answer during the presentation or after? Everybody knows everything about upgrading the Drupal 9. <laughs> Why are you here? Has anybody used um, uh, Gutenberg uh, editor for Drupal? Any idea? I've heard it works okay. I've not used it on Drupal. WordPress, yes, but then the first chance I got, I disabled it. I was not too happy with how it took control over the content. Uh, but uh, Drupal, no. So do you think it would not be worth it to enable or use the, uh, the Gutenberg uh, editor? Well. I, you know, I lean towards structured content all the time, so I'm not really a big fan of uh, these editors. Um, I, I would rather use something like a, like a layout builder, and I know that it's not like in the same um, same league in terms of user experience. But yeah, Gutenberg, there were some issues with, you know, I mean, I just want to write a block of te text and it didn't make it easy. Um, maybe there are other, you know, I've heard of other editors like Prose Mirror and everything which do a better job at this. I've not tried those, so, you know, and, and I don't even know if there is like a Drupal integration yet. Uh, I just know of the editors. Uh, the one I've heard is like, it's called Prose Mirror and it's, um, it looked promising, but again, like no usage data actually. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It looks like Oliver may have dropped off here. Maybe having some technical difficulties. Okay, trick question. Who has a favorite Drupal 9 feature? I think the correct answer is no one because there are no <laughs> Drupal 9 features which are not in Drupal 8.9 right now. 9.1, okay, yeah. Let's see what comes out. I'm, I'm hoping for Claro to be stable. I mean, it's pretty good. I, I use Jin myself, and it's it, it's it works well. But I just don't like the warning in the status report page saying that okay, you know, you're using an experimental theme. That's it. So I'm just hoping for it to be stable. Is that been, has not even been ready or used or, to be used? I have not faced problems with uh, uh, well, like I said, I use Jin, not Claro. Uh, Jin is based on Claro, and you know, it's quite polished. I tried out Claro. Like when it when it was initially released, I tried it out. There were there were a few things which were broken a little bit. It was still usable, but not you know it it, it was not ready for you know uh, you know so that you can remove that experimental status. Um, maybe we'll be there soon, you know. But in any case, like I said, you know I'm, I'm not directly using Claro. I use Jin, and. Uh, it works very well, you know. I just used it on a, a project which was like a temporary thing, but it was like you know in middle of an event and everything. It was like high traffic during those uh, uh, you know like few days, and it worked well. I mean, like all the editors were happy with the experience, and uh, you know, it, and it, it didn't 
take me a lot of effort to set it up as well. Like the whole thing, not just the gen. Gen is of course you just install the theme, but like gen and uh, I was using uh, Oliver on the front end, but this was mostly a decouple thing. And uh, you know other things like gen login and then some of my custom modules to just give that moderation experience. Uh, it worked well. Can you be able to hear me now? There's my microphone still playing up. G I N. G I N. That's right. Yeah, I'll I'll put a link. Uh, yeah, Oliver, we could hear you. Okay, thanks, Neil. Okay, over yeah, to Oliver. Yeah. Thanks for everyone's patience. All right, I think that microphone's playing up, and also Firefox doesn't want to share, so he's on playing ball. Let me. See. Okay, browser can't show your screen. Okay, that's annoying. Why can my browser not show my screen? Sorry, we have some technical problems over here. JD, I don't know whether it might be worth just swapping. I don't know whether Michael's ready to do his yet. If I'm having some issues here, I don't know whether it's worth just swapping around. Yeah, sure. Yeah, if, if you want to swap, I know Michael's Michael's game. Okay, because yeah. I might need to change browser. I think <laughs> seems no uh, it doesn't want to touch you. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna swap over. Thanks for uh, everyone for your flexibility. So we're gonna swap over and first do our second talk <laughs> uh, by Michael Schmidt, which is my best and worst strategies for dealing with high demand work. All right, now me. Uh, now I'm on the. Uh, let me find the present. There we go. All right, and I will also paste a, a direct link into the Slack because I know this video sometimes and there are pictures in it. So you can also click on the link there that is in Slack and you can follow along right away. So you don't have to watch the recording that might doesn't look that well. All right, hello. Uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation um, for presenting today. Um, this is not gonna be about Drupal 9. <laughs> this is not going to be about technical things. It's going to be about the piece that we work every day, which is our own mind, our own body. Um, I uh, I will introduce a bit more about myself uh, in a second, but basically I work a lot, and I work a lot in high demand work, and people always ask me, how do you do this? And I honestly never really thought about it, but I forced myself to do this. I tried to figure out how do I do all of this, and so... Um, yeah, we ended up with a presentation. Uh, my name is Michael. People call me Schnitzel in the Drupal community and also in the interwebs. Um, and yeah, that's my email address. And yeah, I'm in the Drupal Slack, of course, as well. So yeah, about me. I'm um, originally from Switzerland. Um, I live now in the US. I, when we were still allowed to go outside, I went outside a lot. I um, lived in an Airstream for more than a year and traveled all over the US. This is my dog. Uh, her name is Ladybird. And we're going to see some more pictures about her. But yeah, I am I really like to try to go outside as much as I can and experience the US, which is so vastly different from hiking and snowshoeing to um, fishing. So yeah. But where do I come from? As mentioned, I'm originally from Switzerland. Switzerland has a really big focus on apprenticeships, which means after your nine years of school, you join a company and you learn a job on the go. So you join a company for four years and you learn a job. And I did an apprenticeship in IT. And I think there I really realized what work actually means. And I also realized that I really liked doing it. I liked that at the end of the day, I knew what I did. In school, I never really had this. Um, then I went to the Swiss military as every male has to do, um, I went to the Swiss military and I realized quite fast that I like to lead people. I like to lead, organize, make sure that people have food, that the transport is organized, things like that. So I realized that I, that I, a, first I learned how to lead people and I also realized how to do it and that I like it. And the third one now, I'm the CTO of the Amazing Group and yeah, I'm still learning a lot every day of being a CTO of an international company. Um, yeah, and I want to talk about what I've learned so far. 
Um, so in the Amazi group, I actually have three different hats on, and that's one of the problems, but we're working on reducing this. Um, so one of them is I'm a board member, which means I, it's a lot about big questions, steering the companies in the right thing. Then I'm the CTO of the group, meaning I worry a lot about security, IT-related security strategies, stuff like that. And then the job that I'm most involved in is I'm the CTO of the Amazi IO company, meaning uh, we do Drupal hosting. So I do a lot of engineering, architecting, and leadershiping as well because we are around, around 20 people. So you see, I have a lot of to do every day. I also have a lot of different hats on. So um, yeah. And I want to talk about today how I handle all of this. Um, I want to do some acknowledgments, though, and there are three of them. First, things that work for me might not specifically work for you. Um, and also things that might, for me, might work for me right now, they maybe also don't work for me in a year. It's really fluid. It's really changing. And I'm very privileged in the fact that I really love my job. And I'm very aware that this is not the case of everybody. And so I want to acknowledge this, that unfortunately not everybody can have a job that they really love. And so, but in my case, I'm very privileged that I'm, that I have this. And so look it from this side. So one of the things that I really do, I have two quotes that I brought me basically from where I started to here. And I guess, yes, this is an obvious one, but um, the only constant in life is change. And I think that's really something that I also realized is that even if I had the best job that I declared at one point as being the coolest, the best, the most interesting job, even that job after two, three years, if you do the same, is not interesting anymore, or it's not challenging anymore. It's not, it's not worth getting up in the morning anymore. So I realized that I have to constantly change, not too much, but change is just part of me. And change also brings me happiness because I learn new things. I learn something new every single time. And the other one, and that's actually one that I remind myself a lot is by Henry Ford. And he said, when everything seems to be going against you, remember that the airplane takes off against the wind, not with it. And that's a quote I pretty much tell myself probably every couple of weeks, because there are definitely times that I'm sitting in front of my computer and so sort of like, how is this all going to work? How are we getting out of this? We just yesterday had a huge DDoS attack against our infrastructure and they took down our servers and I was sitting there and I was like, how are we doing this? And just looking at this quote or reading it, I'm realizing, hey, there is something going to go out of it. And I, we got out of it. So um, yeah, that's really good. And so I'm looking at that quote quite often. All right. So let's look at a normal day in my life. But actually, before we look at the day, my normal day actually starts the night before. And that's one thing I realized that this really helps me a sleep much better and be ready in the morning. So what this basically means, before I go to bed, I will check my calendar. So I know when do I have meetings, at which time, how many or any of these meetings going to be very um, stressful or is there one with anxiety that involved. So I already know. I just would like to know what happens tomorrow. So I understand what tomorrow will bring. And what I usually do, I set an alarm one hour before the first meeting. And I really try to keep this. There are sometimes cases where I do only 30 minutes. But a lot of times, I really have one hour before the first meeting. Because this gives me, if I wake up and I want to sleep another 15 minutes, I can. If I want to um, take some more time in the morning, um, I can do all of this. And um, that really helps me to not wake up and freak out already that I have a lot of meetings. So that's an important piece that I learned that really helps me. And the last one is something I just recently started is I start to prepare my clothes in the evening that I want to wear in the morning. It sounds crazy, but it's such a big change to me that in the morning I just get up and I don't have to think about where are my clothes, which am I going to wear and stuff. It's a weird thing, but it really helps me easily to um, get up in the morning and be ready faster without taking too many decisions before I had my first cup of coffee. And so that's, that's a really cool thing. All right, then we go to sleep. 
And actually falling asleep is sometimes quite hard, I had to learn. Especially if you have a lot to do and if you saw your calendar and it's maybe already freaking you out or there's something else that goes on or whatever else it is. And so one of the things I learned is that I do two things to fall asleep faster or even fall asleep at all. The first one is I try to relax. And I do this with controlled breathing. And you maybe heard about 748. Um, that's, uh, it's also a meditation um, routine. And basically what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to lay in bed and I'm trying to feel my own pulse. It's a weird thing. It took me a bit of figuring out how this works, but it is possible to feel your pulse if you're just lying on the, in the bed, not actually touching your orthos. And I'm, that already centers me or that fo lets me focus on myself. And then I do four of my own pulses. I breathe into my nose. I hold for seven pulses, which is quite hard. And then I breathe out with eight pulses again through my mouth. And what this, usually I do this three or four times. And interestingly, it really helps me relax. I can feel how my pulse starts to lower itself, starts to relax. And that really helps me to, if I had a stressful day, um, to really, really relax. Now, some people cannot fall asleep while doing this. I can't. And um, because it's quite challenging, like you hold your breath quite long, um, but it really helps me relax. And then the actual falling asleep, so after I do this four, seven, eight routine three or four times, I just start count down from 100. And when I heard this the first time by somebody, I didn't believe that this would work. But I do this now since at least four years, and I never reached zero in my life. The lowest one I can remember was maybe six. And interestingly is I believe the counting down from 100 gives your brain something to do that is a little bit hard. Like it's not, it's not easy because we all can really easily count up, but the counting down is something that needs a bit of brain space, but it also gives your brain to something to think about so it doesn't wander off and talk and think about the next day or the bills you didn't pay and whatever else that currently goes through your mind. And yeah, I never reached zero. Um, I had people that I explained this, they said they reached zero and they just counted into the minus and it all was fine. So nothing is going to happen if you reach zero, just continue. But um, this really helps me. And I, I, whenever I'm stressed and I cannot fall asleep, this helps me every single time. And like I said, I never reached zero. Uh, maybe I did, and then I fell asleep, but I don't remember. That could be, but I cannot actually remember. Okay, then sleep itself. One of the most important things that I do to stay asleep um, is to put my phone on silent. And that means I also turn off the notifications. So um, all the notifications are turned off. The only way that my phone still works is that if somebody actually calls me and that somebody is basically either my family or Pager duty, I wrote it in the other way around here because it's probably more likely that Pager duty is going to call me. Um, but that's the only way that you can reach me. You, if you send me a Slack message, an email, or a Twitter message, this will not create any notifications because it's way too distracting. And then I try to sleep at least six hours. I know that this is very different for different people. For me, I learned six hours is the minimum. I usually get seven, um, and on weekends a bit more. Um, but I realized less than six, I can do it for one night. But then the second night, I need a lot of at least seven. So try to find. But one of the things I also realized is to change your sleeping length too much can also be quite taxing. Um, so I try to usually sleep six to seven hours, even on the weekends, um, because it helps my body to stay in a rhythm rather than sleeping 13 hours over the weekend, then only four hours in a couple of days. And during the week, that's, that also didn't work for me at all. OK, so we fell asleep, or we prepared all the clothes. We fell asleep, we are sleeping, and now we wake up. I have the same wake-up routine every single day. And that really helps me, again, to have something that I can hold on to myself. First of all, I snooze my alarm probably a couple of times. Then I read some light Twitter, and it's, it's 
important. Um, it should have key called light, as in light, not heavy. Sorry, typo. Um, but basically what this means, I have a Twitter follower or a Twitter list of non-political tweets. It's more like technical stuff um, that I can see what's going on, what happened. But really important is I do not read any Slack, and I also do not read any emails. And the reason for that is that if I do this, my brain already starts to think about work and what I have to do and what I missed and what happened last night, um, because we have a 24-hour company, so there's always stuff going on. So I really try to not do this at all. So I get up, I shower, I let the dog out, I feed the dog, which is also something interesting. I try to do something good for something else, and my dog is really appreciative if she gets fed, which makes me happy. Um, so I have a happy, um, I start my day always with a happy thing. I make coffee, and then I open my notebook, and then I fully deep down, uh, deep, uh, deep, dive deep into work. And then I read all the emails, then I read all the slacks, but I, I am up, I'm dressed, I have showered, I have a coffee, and then work can overtake me. Then you don't try to talk to me anymore. But up until then, I'm really trying to not freak out myself with too much looking at all that stuff. Then for me, breakfast, I can't really go without. Um, I tried without it, and it definitely doesn't work. My team members can even tell me that uh, a hungry Michael is not a happy Michael. So I really need to eat in the morning. Um, but I don't really have time because at one point I still want to work. So I found um, Soylent as an alternative. It's a drinkable meal. It has 400 calories. It exactly helps me. It has some coffee in it as well. Um, it, this really helps me because I cannot really focus on eating at that point, but I need something in my body. So that really helped me um, to get up in the morning. Then about the days itself, my life is ruled by my calendar. Um, I use it my, like my assistant. So if people ask me like, hey, can I have a meeting tomorrow? I'm like telling them, look, I have no idea. I ask my calendar. All my employees have access to my calendar. There's no hidden secret meetings or anything. They can see what's going on. I use calendly.com for external things. So people can see my calendar and request meetings. And if I really need focus time, I block off time. So I go into the calendar and I put in a calendar invite in it that says blocker and people know don't don't book a meeting during that time because my calendar will actually decline it automatically. Um, so that's really how I work. Um, I don't have an assistant that runs my calendar. So I just let my calendar run myself. The next really, really important thing, I really try to add little breaks in between. So and these breaks really help me to shortly come down again, relax, or focus on something else. So these are usually five minutes between meetings. And I do something that makes me happy. Um, so that can be like play, go out, play with the dog for a couple of minutes, make coffee, watch a YouTube video of my favorite tech channels or so. And that really also helps me to get up. What I realized is if I'm sitting the whole day in front of the computer without getting up, that is really hard for myself because I cannot really, there's a time where I'm over on focusing. And so what I do actually, I drink a lot of water. So I always have a water bottle beside next to me and I will drink a lot of water. And the good thing is this will, you will by yourself get forced to get up and go to the bathroom. And that also helps me focusing or walking around that a lot of times I really have a hard problem that I cannot solve and I go to the bathroom where I get it up, and while walking, I'm realizing a solution. And that really, like, sometimes moving around gets your body thinking about different things, different places, and that really helps me. And then I do a bigger break for lunch, usually 30, 45 minutes, and I really also try to focus on that. I hate eating in front of the computer and doing work, I'm eating a lot in front of the computer, but I'm doing something else. Um, that also helps me again to focus. Or if possible, I eat lunch with my girlfriend, again, go out with the dog, etc. So that's also like a bit of cornerstone. If I don't have a real lunch break, I'm 
having a really hard time getting through the day. Then, how do I focus? A, music. Um, so pretty much all day long, I have uh, comfy headphones that took me some time to find some good ones with some good noise cancelling, which also helps you focusing. And I actually have different music playlists. So I have like liked songs. I have like 200 songs that I really like. And that's, they play actually pretty much all day long. It's weird that I'm listening to the same music all the time, but it just helps me. I don't know, it's maybe something I know. It's a constant pattern. I know which song is coming up, so that really helps me. Then I also have some motivational music. So if I really feel down or having a hard time, came off on a hard meeting, I'm listening to that. Then if I feel like a bit more adventurous, I use Spotify suggestions um, to find new music. And then um, also one thing I realized is that if I'm writing like blog posts or long texts, long emails, I really have some instrumental music because as a non-native English speaker, it's really hard for me to listen to speaking words or singing and writing. My brain somehow cannot handle this at the same time. So I listen to a lot of instrumental music uh, to write. Then another thing for focusing, um, I'm with my girlfriend. We both work from home. So there is, she is having a break and walks into my room. And so what we figured out is to, we need a way to tell each other that we're working, that or we're on a call, even though I'm not talking, I'm maybe on a call. And so this is just a tiny indicator that you put on your notebook and you can make it different colors. And um, so like if it is red, she knows, okay, if she wants to talk to me, and talk to me via chat. Like we send me a Slack message, send me an iMessage chat. And, but I'm right now, I'm really busy. If yellow means I'm busy, but you could talk to me. And then green or it's off, it, I'm not busy at all. So, and that really helped uh, because we had many times that like she asked me a question while I was really focusing or something. And that's, that was really hard and distracting. Then overall talking about not over instructing emails or notification overall in general and specifically about emails. I stopped having notifications for emails in my browser, not on my Mac, not on my phone, nowhere. Because for me, nothing has been, is that important that it couldn't wait for an hour that comes via email. Because urgent stuff anyway happens via Slack or PagerDuty. My team knows if they need me, they open a PagerDuty issue and assign it to me and I will get there but don't send me an email with saying help or something. And what I do, I check emails in between meetings. Usually I only have a couple of minutes for that. So um, what I do, I use like um, snoozing um, in Google Mail to you. So if I see one and I read it, I mark it as read. If I can, I follow up right away. Even though I think, oh, it will only take a minute, I will rather follow up and not have read the other mails. And yeah, if I don't have time at all, I use the snooze button of the email so to uh, get them back. Then one important thing, I have a separate private from company email because my family, myself, they live all over the world. So organization of family gatherings and stuff happens sometimes during the day and I really wanna focus on, on, on company stuff. So during the day, I only read my company email and during the evening, the nights, on the weekends, I, re I, I read my personal email and I don't use like combined inboxes and all that stuff. That didn't really work for me. And yeah, then inbox zero, oh well, I try every couple of months. It works for like two minutes and then it's failing again, but I have not figured this out yet. So if you can, great, I can't, and I'm not even trying to anymore. Slack, A, I'm really strict with notifications in Slack. So I have a lot of custom notifications for each individual channel. Most of the channels I mention only. So only if somebody mentions me, I actually get a notification. Uh, and only a few important ones, I really have notifications for everything because I wanna know if people are talking. Then I use disable thread notifications because Slack automatically makes notifications for these. So I disable them immediately. And then I have different groups of Slack channels. So I have like, some that I say I need to read all the time. That's usually customer and internal ones. So if I open Slack and they, there's an unread message, I go immediately in and read them. Um, but I didn't get notifications for them. Then I have important internal ones, meaning I read them if I have time. I have important customer related ones. Again, I read them if I have time. And then I have a lot of other channels. We have around 
a thousand Slack channels at Amazie with all kind of different things of fun stuff and things. And I just, they're always there and I read them if I have time. But I also know if I don't read them, nothing is going to happen really. And then I use Slackbot a lot. So if somebody pings me and I don't have time, I use the Slackbot reminder like I use for the email so I get reminded later so I don't forget anything. Because if I don't react at the point, I will definitely forget about it. Then all other chat systems, especially used by my family or other things like iMessages, WhatsApp, I mute them during the day as much as possible. I don't want to get another distraction. I already have enough, so I try to mute them as much as possible. And then sometimes I really need 100% focus. Um, that's only for a couple of hours, but then I turn off everything. Like sometimes I even disconnect the internet from the computer. And the only way then I'm reachable is via pager duty. So again, my team knows if they need me, they can call me via the phone. But sometimes this is really necessary. And I really love that time. It, I don't get it enough. And I don't really get it a lot. But sometimes this is the only way is to really disconnect yourself and focus on one thing and one thing only. And um, yeah. All right. So that's how I get through my day. One other thing that I started is doing retrospectives. And the background picture is actually from the Apollo Command Center, where every station was able to update their status report at any time um, to, the, to the head. And so they had a red, yellow, and green. And that's what I'm doing. So basically, I'm doing retrospectives about myself. And so what I'm trying to do is I choose a specific time that I will remember. Could be shower on Saturday morning, lunch on Friday, the workout on Sunday. It doesn't matter what, but something you do every week. And I ask myself is, did the positive things in this week outweigh the negative things? And I'm asking this specifically that way because no week will ever be perfect. You will never have a week where nothing was negative. But for me, important is that the positive things have to outweigh the negative things. And I can answer this question, yes or no. Then um, I also ask myself, did I succeed in changing the last week's goal? So I set in myself a goal for every upcoming week. And then if I couldn't, then I just keep the same goal. Like I don't have to create these impossible goals. And sometimes a goal takes five or six weeks to achieve, but then and um, that's perfectly fine. And then I, if I decide I want to have a new goal, I will also decide, okay, what is this goal? What will I change? And I'm usually sometimes I'm just choosing something tiny and small. For example, I realized that I, where I'm working right now, I don't have a water bottle with me all the time. So I decided to buy a water bottle that I like and I will force myself next week to drink more water. So that's, um, it's super tiny things, but I basically can reach 52 goals a year. And if I reach 52 goals, I mean, that's already more than I probably would ever reach. So um, just do tiny changes, silly changes, small changes, and they will make you overall over a whole year and they will make you happy. All right, that's me, how I do things. If there are any questions or inputs, things that worked for you, maybe didn't work, I would be very happy to learn because at the end, I think it's not just me, <laughs> we're all in this together. And I think sharing and talking about these topics is super important. And so I'm happy to also hear from you what you think. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I'm sure some other folks have some questions. Uh, that was really great. Um, personally, I um, have found turning notifications off for everything except the most critical important things um, to be so important, <laughs> both on my phone and on my computer. Um, so if anybody out there has their phone dinging and donging on random things like emails coming in, um, I would strongly endorse uh, Michael's <laughs> method of, of disabling those notifications and you know you can get more more granular with how you get notified i think that can make a big difference totally yeah who uh who's got a question out there or a, a tip
Yeah, I, I, I got a tell question. Hi, Michael. Hey, How hello. <laughs> How are you doing? So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I know I know you like, I don't know, five or six years ago. Remember your uh, keynote at uh, one of our camps? So, uh, yeah, I was, first of all, I was very impressed by the presentation and uh, very impressed by you. And I know you work a lot. Uh, uh, we, we met a couple of times uh, in camps and cons in Europe. Uh, so what, what's changed, like, when you were going to the office versus now when you're like, constantly at home? Like, uh, this, you know, this tips that or um, things that you're doing right now, are they applicable in, like, real life? Like, uh, can, can you do, like, a comparison? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... I actually started to work from home almost two years ago. So two years ago, we switched completely to remote and worked from home. And one of the things I really had to learn is that I had to shield myself even more from the not, from disturbing or notifications. Like when I went to work, I left my home. So the things that bothered me about the home or things that I had to do. And these are little easy things like, I don't know, didn't clean up or like um, there is stuff in the, in the, in the, um, or didn't do laundry or things like that. Or even my girlfriend, like just coming in and like if she had something like we didn't do the budget yet or things like that, that was just way more, um, challenging than going to an office that shields you from your private life. If it sounds weird, but this is what it is. And so one thing we now both did is I'm lucky enough to have a separate room that I work in. So there is a place in that I only spend time in when I'm working. And I don't spend time in here when I don't work. And so it's like this place that I can go to work, but if I leave, my brain can also say, okay, the work is behind me. So that really helped me. If there was a time where I like just worked like in the living room or in the kitchen and stuff, and that was really hard because then, so long story short, I think if I still need this like separation of the time or of the rooms. So that really helps me. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions for Michael? I see there's water drinking happening. That's good. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Michael, thank you so much. Let's have a round of applause for Michael. Thank you. It's not quite the same as in person. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, Michael. That was great. And um, we're going to rewind and have our first talk second. Um, so, Oliver, whenever you're ready, we're ready for you. Well, we're going to try. Let's see if we have a bit more, a uh, bit more luck this time. So let's see. I think last time it was Chrome was giving me some problems. I was trying to share, but oh, something was. But anyway, let's see how if this works any better. Okay. I mean, I can see the little lines go up and down now, so I'm guessing people can hear me because that wasn't happening before. Yep. Yeah. Looks screen share looks better now. Awesome. Okay. What I'll also do is put this link in the chat as well. So that was a good idea. Uh, there we go. So okay, if you need to follow along or want to check them out after the fact. Okay, so um, yeah, apologies for the technical issues with your own. Uh, apologies also for having to sort of cancel. I think it was meant to do this last month. Um, I was having a few yeah, dual related pain problems last month, so I had to reschedule that as well. Uh, but thanks to JD and everybody for having me speak. Um, I think one of the you know good things, if you can say that, doing all the COVID problems, is I've been attending and, and giving talks a lot of remote meetups and conferences because 
everything's remote now, at least for now. Um, so yeah, um, this meetup being you know, being one of them. So um, I think I've been, I think three or four, maybe five of these now. So uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to give a talk. Um, and this is a new talk uh, I've been putting together, you know, recently. So it's probably still a little, a little rough around the edges, probably uh, compared to some of the ones I've done a few times. Uh, a little bit about me, just to begin with. Uh, my name is Oliver Davis. Uh, I'm a software engineer at a company called Invica. Uh, I'm based in the UK. Uh, Invica primarily is based in the UK and Germany. Although we've got a people or a few, a few places around Europe as well. I think a couple in the States, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I've been doing Drupal for, uh, I think, about 12 years, I think, now, for, for quite a while. Um, I used to be a developer at the Drupal Association, and I've worked for various UK-based agencies and companies. Um, I'm pretty much OP Davis everywhere online, and there's a couple of links here to my website and to my Drupal.org profile on my Twitter account. Um, yeah, and I'm, I maintain various projects on Drupal.org, as in modules and, and themes, so uh, as well as you know building sites for clients during the day and also during the evening. So um, yeah, we'll be so sort of looking at this from sort of both sides really. I've also got my own spot. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is a tweet that I put out uh, recently-ish, uh, maybe five or six weeks ago now. Uh, and as I said, I've been doing Drupal for quite a while. Um, so yeah, this, that's what the tweet says. Um, it's been 10 years since I've been working on Drupal full time. So I think it's about 12 or 13 altogether. Um, so I started, it was Drupal 6, maybe sort of the end of Drupal 5 time. And I've been working, yeah, so for Drupal 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Um, so I've been around the community for quite a, a fair amount of time. And I've worked on various Drupal 6 to Drupal 7 and Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 migrations and upgrades and rebuilds. So I've got a, a little bit of experience, I guess, in this area of, of moving between these major versions. Um, before we get into the Drupal 9 stuff, um, I'm just going to do a little bit of a recap about you know, what we've currently got um, in the existing setup. So uh, the Drupal 7 release cycle, uh, this is one long-running development branch for Drupal 7. Uh, there's minor versions for bug fixes. So 7.72 is the current Drupal 7 version. Uh, so that means we've had 72 releases of Drupal 7. Uh, and within that, there's been no big new features, at least you know, nothing that really sort of springs to mind. There may have been sort of some small sort of new things introduced, um, but you know, nothing like sort of layout builder or um, you know, media like we've had in, in the recent Drupal 8 versions. Uh, and that's meant that if you're committing patches to core, uh, it's going to take a long time potentially for those things to get committed and or at least available for people to use. Uh, the Drupal 8 release cycle is quite different. So semantic version was added, semantic versioning was added to core. Uh, so rather than having just our 7.72, we've got a a three-digit version number now, uh, with minor versions for new features being released every six months. So things like Layer Builder, again, and, and Media uh, have been released into Drupal 8 as part of the existing Drupal 8 release cycle, rather than having to wait for a new major version. And patch releases that include bug fixes are coming out every month as well. And this means we've got multiple supported versions of core at any given time. So, so ignoring Drupal 7 for this, this slide, but currently we've got Drupal 8.8 8 and 8.9 uh, both being supported as well as 9.0 as, as well. Uh, so this is very much a, a shift from the uh, it will be ready when it's ready uh, approach. And it's more, uh, we know we're shipping on X date or around X date and anything that gets committed by that will be included. If not, we'll go into the next, the next release. So it's quite a, a mindset shift for the, for the community at large. Uh, this is a, a diagram coming from uh, this page on Drupal.org. So this is just outlining the um, security and the supported windows and the uh, for yeah, 8.5, 8.6, 8.7. So basically what I just sort of explained uh, in a little visual 
visual form there. So you can see there's some overlap between versions becoming supported and preparation for the new one coming out. So again, in, in Drupal 7, we didn't have any of this. Everything was very linear, and there wasn't this of multiple branches and overlapped versions and things. So a comparison of, of Drupal 8 versus Drupal 9. Uh, there's no new functionality in Drupal 9 compared to Drupal 8. So again, this is very different to what we've seen before. Um, a lot of people, when the Drupal 9 announcement was done, uh, people, oh yeah, what's the new features? What's what's been the new thing that's gone to Drupal 9? Uh, and there hasn't been any, anything new added. Uh, what in fact has happened is, is the deprecated code has been removed from core. Uh, and that's gonna be quite an important part of, of the rest of this talk. Uh, and by deprecated code, I mean uh, code that's been updated or, or rewritten in, as part of the pro as part of core, um, and it's been marked to be removed in a, a future version. So, i.e., in, in Drupal nine, this piece of code will be removed, um, but it's not been removed straight away to keep that backwards compatibility layer intact. Uh, so, something like Drupal set message is the one that springs to mind for me. Um, the Drupal set message function was removed. Um, in Drupal 9, um, but prior to that, it was flagged as being deprecated. So Drupal set message was still work, um, but they'd been replaced by a messenger service. Uh, and then Drupal set message itself had been updated to use the, the new approach behind the scenes as well. Uh, the PHP required version has been increased. So if you're using anything lower than PHP 7.3, you'll need to increase that to run Drupal 9. And then also the major versions of dependencies have been updated. So the major version of Symfony uh, being the main dependency that springs to mind has been upgraded from Symfony 3 to Symfony 4. And then previous upgrade issues, uh, just my opinions, uh, lots of breaking changes. So particularly if you've done a, a Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 migration or rebuild, uh, there are lots and lots of breaking changes with the uh, addition of the Symfony components and object-oriented code everywhere. Um, the code base between 7 and 8 is, is vastly different. Uh, if you're going to want to make a sort of migration between those two versions, you have to look at making a lot of changes. Essentially, pretty much every, every upgrade I've done from 7 to 8 has been uh, start fresh with a, a new code base, rebuild everything from scratch, um, and, and start again rather than having to do any sort of upgrade or, or much from there. Uh, core was released, uh, but contrib takes some time uh, to catch back up again. So I'm thinking when Drupal 8 was released, um, or oh, sorry, when Drupal 7 was released. Um, I can't think which version. No, views went into core in, in eight, so it must have been seven. Uh, core was released, but then the views module uh, took around six months, I think, if I remember correctly, to be released. So that slowed down the adoption of Drupal 7 uh, quite considerably because people wouldn't use core Drupal 7 until all the modules they needed also been, had also been upgraded. Uh, and I think and Jeff Gerling wrote a, a blog post, uh, which is called uh, Did Drupal did breaking backwards compatibility kill Drupal, uh, which is, is something I'm about halfway through reading, but goes into this sort of idea of the number of breaking changes in core, uh, is that, was that um, essentially bad for, for Drupal? Because yeah, that, that's been a, a tricky conversation to have, um, particularly with some clients, is you know, it's, you know, we've built this website for you and now we need to you know, essentially start again with it. Uh, there have been some improvements um, for contrib. So um, minimal code changes required. So for, for most contrib modules to move from eight to nine, um, there's maybe even as much as one line needs changing in, in contrib module uh, if people are keeping up to date with the deprecations and, and updates. Uh, so yeah, rather than have to do a, a big rebuild of your module, we can potentially just make yeah, it's just a one line change. And then a single release can support multiple versions of core. So some modules uh, can support Drupal 7, uh, sorry, Drupal 8 and Drupal 9 at the same time. Um, so as a module maintainer, this is quite, this is quite different. And then more recently, uh, semantic versioning was enabled for contrib projects as well. So previously it was only available in core, but now it's been also added for contrib as well. 
this is a screenshot of one of the projects on Drupal.org. Uh, you can see that there's a, a, a 2.7, 8.x, 2.7 release. And then below that, you can see there it says requires Drupal and then caret 8 or caret 9. So even though it's a, an 8.x version, uh, it also supports Drupal 9. And the little sort of subtitle says that as well, Drupal 9 compatibility. Uh, although in this project, there's also a 2.0.0 release, which also supports Drupal 8 and Drupal 9. Uh, this is a semantic versioning approach. So because we can support Drupal 8 and 9 in the same module, having the 8.x prefix doesn't make that much sense anymore. So you can see that we've moved to a, a 2.0.0 without the Drupal version number of the prefix has been removed optionally at this point. Um, and interesting, just looking at this slide now, uh, the, the sizes here is are quite different. So you can see the, uh, the 2.7 releases are 97 kilobyte size, whereas the 2.01 is only eight kilobytes, which is quite interesting. And yeah, the, the difference between the two or between any Drupal 8 and Drupal 9 version is deprecated code. So again, by deprecated code, I mean code that's been replaced by newer code uh, and we will be removed in a later version. Uh, that's really big. Strange. Okay, it did not this big earlier on. Um, so this is the Drupal set message example. So you can see we've got a, a, a still got a global function there called Drupal set message. And within that function, we're going to use uh, trigger error, which is going to write an error into our log that basically says that the Drupal set message uh, function is deprecated and will be, re will be removed before Drupal 9. And it tells you there, um, if you can see the whole message, uh, what to use instead. So it actually says use Drupal uh, slash messenger, messenger service add message instead uh, with a link to the, the change record. And then within the actual function itself, um, you can see it's actually calling the new messenger service within the old function. So the old code is calling the new code. So there's still only one piece of code to maintain, which is the new messenger service. Uh, again, for that backwards compatibility layer with the, the old function is still kicking around until it's removed in the newer version. So how do you go about finding this deprecated code in, in our own modules and in our own code bases? So there's a, a few tools that we can use. One of them is Drupal Check. And this was developed by Mark Lauman of uh, Centaro, formerly Commerce Guys. And from the GitHub page, it says uh, it's built on PHP Stan. Uh, so it's a static analysis tool that will check for correctness uh, in your code, which includes deprecation errors and classes that don't exist. And this is the link to the GitHub page. And this is how we include it into a project. So we can use Composer, uh, Composer Global Require, if you want to install it globally, or just Compose Require to install it into your project. And once you've done that, we can then just run Drupal Check and then provide the path. So this will be uh, just run it on the custom, the custom modules directory. Um, I did this on uh, one of my own projects, um, it's just a, a simple demo project, aids for a different talk. Uh, and this is the output they gave me. So it came back with one one error uh, where a um, uh, type hint was incorrect using a deprecated class. Uh, the other tool that I've used a lot is the uh, upgrade status module. So this is a, a module that's on triple.org. Uh, we can install and it will give us um, an upgrade status list in, in the back end of our site. Uh, there's a number of, uh, this is from the Upgrade status feature, sorry. Um, the upgrade status page, uh, it does a comparison of the field, the functionality inside Drupal check and the one that's inside upgrade status. So it seems that upgrade status is, from this at least, more sort of fully functional, I guess, at, at this point. Uh, that's what I've been using uh, for some of my own projects, which you'll see an example of in a moment. Uh, the third way I've been using is um, the PHP unit bridge. So Drupal 8 uses uh, the PHP unit bridge from Symfony uh, on top of the regular PHP unit. Uh, and this includes a, a deprecation helper. And essentially what that means is when you're running the tests, uh, running your tests on your, your project, uh, it will display any deprecation of this is in the side of the test output. 
So again, this is just from a, a test project. You can see it's, it's run some tests. It's run um, one, one test with some assertions, uh, which is why we've got the green the green bar there. And then below that remaining deprecation notice is one. And we can see we've got a, a Drupal set message there. And that's the full message you would have seen a couple of slides ago if it wasn't blown up really, really big. And again, it tells exactly what, what's been deprecated, uh, when it will be removed, and what to replace it with, and, and a link to the change record, which is pretty cool. Uh, so how do we fix the deprecations? Um, we know that in this case, Drupal set message has been removed. So all we need to do essentially is just replace it with the new way of doing it. So if the new way is to use the Drupal Messenger service and the add message function in this case, then we just need to change that in our code base and make a commit that makes that change. So the next tool I want to talk about is Composer. So Composer, for anybody who's not familiar, is a, the dependency management tool for PHP. Uh, and it's my preferred way of managing Drupal code bases. Um, I used Drush Make before and, and various other things, but yeah, Composer has been my preferred way for, for some time. Uh, and the, the Drupal 8 um, integration with the Composer has just really got better over time. So uh, if you're not using Composer, I definitely recommend looking at it for your projects. And the Composer JSON file is a file that where you list your dependencies and your version constraints. So for Drupal itself, um, say Drupal itself uses various Symfony components. So the Symfony components are the depend are dependencies of Drupal in that, in that situation. Uh, for my you know, website project, Drupal is a dependency of that project. Uh, in the same way, I guess, that you know, a CSS framework is sort of a dependency of your theme. Uh, within that file, we can set version constraints. So we can say, as well as having to say, hey, we want to install this exact version, we can say install um, you know, every, this version plus any minor releases, any patch, any patch, any bug fix releases. And then we've got another file, which is composer.lock. Um, when composer goes through, figures out which of the versions that fit our constraints, uh, the lock file would store the exact versions then of what's been installed. Uh, as well as any dependencies of the dependencies as well. So it might be, for example, that let's say we require the path auto module and the path auto module relies on token. Uh, we don't need to include token directly. Um, Composer will figure that out by the nature of it being a, a dependency manager rather than just a package manager. And there are separate packages now for Drupal core, so there's one for the Drupal core recommended project. There's one for core dev, which includes the development tools such as PHP unit, and one separate one for the composer scaffold. And one of the nice things about composer as well is it's pretty much used for by all the PHP projects at this point, at least you know, the, as well as standalone projects like Symfony and Laravel use them for managing their dependencies. Um, Drush does now, now it's using some Symfony components as well. Um, and the, the Drupal console before that as well. Um, so as well as de yeah, dependencies for, for projects, I mean, if I'm going to be using um, admin toolbar module, then that also is a dependency of my project. So I can use a command called compose require and all the Drupal modules and projects are in the Drupal namespace. And Drupal.org knows how to translate this um, to be, you know, with how to know which module to download. And we just give it the machine name from the Drupal dog page at add underscore toolbar. And after the colon, that's the version constraint here. So we're going to say uh, we want 2.0 or greater. So any patch release from, from this, any minor version. So 2.0 plus until we get to three, um, because it has that, that carrot at the beginning. Compose from install is the command that we're going to run to actually download the dependencies onto the, the local disk. And then to do an update of that of that module, we can just run the composer update command if a, a new version is released within within our constraints. So we want to be able to update it. So we don't need to go to Drupal.org and download it manually. Compose will do that for us. And just notes on this: um, if you are going to use Composer to manage your dependencies, make sure that you always run 
Composer install with the, the dash dash no dev flag um, for production. So this will just prevent development uh, dependencies being included in your project, uh, stop them from being installed, and then prevent any potential security issues from being added into your production environment. So because things like PHP unit um, are dev dependencies, so shouldn't be available in production. So just have a look at an example. Um, this is a, an example project called Drancible. So this is from my the Drupal Drupal Ansible talk. So Drancible, um, and then I looked at upgrading this onto Drupal nine recently. So we'll just see how I went and did that. Um, this is the project on GitHub, and yeah, it's um, it's a if this was a Drupal eight point eight project, I think, and uh, it's a very simple module uh, with one custom. Very simple project with one custom module for displaying a simple message, which is pretty much just a wrapper around um, Drupal set message, and just displays a, a small message at the top of the page saying, um, "Yeah, I'm on a Vagrant box, and this was deployed with with Ansible and, and Ancestrano." So, uh, a bit of a simple example to, just to start with. Uh, and these are the steps I took. Um, so, I had to remove Drush. Uh, I have Drush as a as a dependency in my project as in the in my composer JSON file, um, I had to remove it temporarily. Um, when I was first moving from Drupal eight point eight to eight point nine, um, I was getting stuck on one of the on beta two or beta three of eight point nine. Um, something with Drush was stopping it from grading all the way to eight point nine point three. I think um, there's probably a better way of doing it, but I found just removing it temporarily um, allowed that upgrade to. to to upgrade properly. Um, my first step was to upgrade from 8.8 to 8.9. Uh, I was going to add the upgrade status module. Uh, updated the contrib modules to the Drupal 9 compatible versions. So I was using admin toolbar module and was using a version that's a couple of versions out of date. So I uh, made sure to update that to the newest version. Uh, I was using the Composer installer uh, module profile, um, and then I was just using that when I was doing a deploy to just reinstall um, the site from the existing config. Um, that was no longer needed, and there isn't going to be a Drupal 9 version of that module. So I no longer needed it, so I just removed that from my, from my code base. Um, fixed the deprecation warnings in my custom code. So as I said, there's a, a call to Drupal set message that I knew that would cause an issue when I moved to, to nine. And then finally, almost finally, uh, upgrade from 8.9 to nine. Um, so again, those are essentially the same. Um, just one doesn't have all the deprecated code. So uh, once I moved to nine, I could see all the deprecations needed fixing and then did that before uh, moving to nine. And then when that was done, I uh, removed the upgrade status module again and re-added re -added Drush. Um, so it was there again for when I needed to use it for my deploy. So this is a screenshot from the upgrade status module. Um, so this is post upgrade to 8.9. Um, so everything is green, everything is fine. So we're on a, a good version of Drupal 8.9 to, to start with. Uh, it's going to check our PHP version. So it's at least 7.3. I was running 7.4.9. And I was using the correct versions of MySQL and the correct version of Apache and, and Drush. So that's an interesting point, actually. Uh, I'm pretty sure I was, I was using Drush 9 for this when I started. And then it was installed 10 afterwards. So that maybe there's some version difference there that was causing the issue. Now I think about it. And um, there were only two projects. As I said, um, admin toolbar module and then the configuration installer. So just to begin with that, each this is the upgrade status output that's giving me this now. So it's done a scan of my site and it's showing me which modules are there and which ones it's going to check. And there's also the one custom project, which is the simple message module. So then we just want to run a scan. So it's going to check those three projects and check for any, any issues. And yeah, there's there's some issues in, in that simple message module, which I was aware of beforehand. So I knew there's a, a Drupal set message issue in there. And I think probably also need to change 
uh, the core version requirement as well. So if I click on that little link there, uh, we get this little pop-up. So, and it gives us some options. So we can fix it now with automation as well. So um, there's a tool called the Drupal Rector project. Um, and I opted into this for a couple of my projects and I actually got automated fixes to some of my contrib projects through so using a tool called Rector. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, upgrade state this is suggesting where I can do this. So uh, it actually could go through and yeah, make this change for me automatically if I wanted to, which is pretty awesome. Uh, so yeah, we could fix the Drupal set message that way. Uh, and then also we need to change um, the core the core key in our info.yaml file is now being replaced uh, with the core version requirement file. So it supports both eight and nine at the same time. So behind the scenes, I went and fixed those, uh, did, did another scan, and then my custom project is now green. So there's no known errors now. Uh, upgrading that module to Drupal 9. Everything is Drupal 9 compatible. Our info file is saying that our module is Drupal 8 and Drupal 9 compatible. and uh, all the deprecated code has been upgraded to use a newer version. The admin toolbar module, yeah, here I'm using 2.0. Uh, slightly confusing there, it says this module is ready for Drupal 9. In fact, that version isn't. Um, it doesn't have the info file change, but it, does, it is telling me that there's a, an available update there to 2.3. So I went and, and did that as well. Uh, then after running some composer commands, um, you can see now that our Drupal version is shown now was 9.0.3. And this is the pull request for that project. So um, I decided a new branch based off our, off the main branch before doing this. Uh, you can see in the top right here, there's quite a lot of changes. Like a few thousand lines have been added and changed. Uh, but it's only actually six files that have been changed uh, as part of this pull request. And four of those are sort of fairly project specific. We wouldn't have any of the, the tool Ansible directory uh, there at all. Obviously, the simple message is custom module. Uh, the core extension is because I'm changing um, the config installer has been removed. So I no longer need to install um, using config installer. I need to use the existing config flag instead. Again, so all of those are project specific. So I could Probably even just get away with you know some projects where you need maybe two files or three files for me changing, and then this is you know, substantially different to any other upgrade I've ever done from a six to seven or a seven to eight rebuild. This would have um, yeah, it could be it could be it's probably the easiest project major major version upgrade ever. And obviously, it's a fairly contrived example with being uh, there's only one custom module and everything, but. I think it just goes to show how simple that it actually can be. There were some gotchas um, that, that wasn't really expecting. And I think that this is because I was using auto wiring inside that simple, simple message module. Um, auto wiring, why is this? Sorry about that. So there's an, an error here that's saying that um, the Symfony config resource wasn't didn't exist. So this was um, slightly unexpected. I wasn't particularly expecting to have this error pop up. Uh, although it was pretty pretty straightforward to fix. Um, I need just need to add composer composer require Symfony config. Uh, the uh, Symfony's configuration component. Uh, although by default, it did try to install version five, which has uh, been released fairly recently. Um, so just to be in line with the other Symfony components we were pulling in, I've added that version constraint there to say install any version of Symfony Config 4. Uh, and after installing that, that version, that error went away. And then also another one that was saying, uh, cannot auto wire this service. Um, so inside my constructor, I'm injecting the new messenger component. Um, and this was being done using, again, using auto wiring. So th this is my services file for that module. So you can see we've got uh, auto wire colon true. So rather than having to specify each of the dependencies for the constructor separately, I can um, Drupal or the dependency injection container will figure out which ones need to be injected and do so. Um, 
this was changed, I think, in one of the versions of Symphony's DI container. And essentially, I need to add in these two lines here. So uh, we just need to add an alias into the messenger interface, and alias it to be messenger. And after that, it worked fine. So those are issues you may or may not hit on your own projects if you're using, depending if you're using auto wiring or not. So yeah, I think the big thing, uh, the big takeaway for me uh, about this is um, something that the tree said, and the big thing about Drupal 9 is it shouldn't, in fact, be a big deal at all. Uh, as I said, I, um, I did this in, in for the transport project in about maybe an, around an hour or maybe two hours, uh, which is, yeah, definitely the shortest and easiest major version upgrade I've ever done uh, with no big, you know, no big rewrites. I'm not a, I'm not a sit down and rewrite any code. All I've done is update it to make sure that what is there is compatible with the new version. And in fact, it's such a such a, such not a big deal. Even um, Drupal 10 is already sort of on the roadmap. So uh, Drupal 10 is going to be released in in around June 2022, uh, and then Drupal 9 will be end of end of life in October 23. Uh, and that lines up with the Symphony 4 end of life um, around in that time as well. So, yeah, essentially we're having to bump to Drupal 10 um, because of the, the major version end of life in Symphony and other components there as well. Um, but again, uh, it's going to be another another easy upgrade. So essentially repeating the same steps that, that um, we just talked about there. And what I'm going to do as well is um, that on the transport commit messages there, or I'll gonna I'm just I'll write up the actual commands into a blog post as well. So they're there for future reference for me as well for everybody else. Um, I do usually like to do a, a shout out for the association um, for talks. I know you've mentioned the association and supporting the association already. Um, as a former employee of the DA, I do like to still be an advocate and. Um, Advocate, uh, yeah, advocate for the DA. Um, but yeah, a lot of this work has been, you know, facilitated and made possible by the association and community members. So yeah, if um, you're not a member, or your organisation isn't a member, I would definitely, you know, suggest becoming a, a member and supporting the, the association. Uh, there's a few useful links here to some of the things that we've talked about. Um, I'll make these slides available afterwards, or they're in Slack already, I think, as well. And then, yeah, finally, um, if anyone's got any questions, um, we've got some time for questions now. Well, feel free to get in touch with me through my website or Twitter or um, I'm in the Drupal NYC Slack as well. Fantastic. So much, thank you so much, Oliver. And um, who's got some questions? Can you? I have a question. Can you briefly um, uh, go over PHP versions with Drupal versions, or do you have? Do you know where that's written down somewhere? Uh, it's definitely on Drupal.org somewhere. I, I can find the exact link. Um, and find it quickly. Versions. Was it maybe this one? Yeah. Uh, PHP requirements. Essentially everything. Um, seven three. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, great. Yeah, there we go. So that's this has got a breakdown of, of everything. Um, that said, I mean, I've been using I've been using seven three and seven four uh, in production now for some time and not had any issues. By a couple of contrib modules and then submitted some packages back upstream for those. Great, thanks. So I'll pop that link in Slack as well. If, uh, if need. I, guess I, I have a question. Um, I, one of the gotchas that I you know, we were kind of waiting for contribute modules to catch up. 
But one thing I was really surprised about was Drupal console. And I mean, in general, has that sort of fallen out of favor or um, I mean, are people expecting this to go forward? There's a bug um, that was basically the problem with Drupal console is that it's uh, a Symphony 2.3 thing. And um, there's a bug that I'll paste into Slack, but it's been out there since 2019. And it's basically, it hasn't been assigned to anybody. Um, it's a little above my pay grade, but uh, I just pasted that in there. Um, and I just wondered if anybody had any info on, you know, who might be able to help move that forward. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's been officially stopped being developed or maintained now, but I think generally my or well, my feeling on it is a lot of the development, the core of the code generation tools that console was doing has been moved into Drush now anyway. Okay. So it seems to be a lot of people going towards that. Um, but I've not seen anything official to say that they're stopping maintaining it. I don't know if anybody else has heard anything. Yeah, I'm I'm on the uh, the, the Heco Drupal um list, you know, in GitLab, and I get emails on, on changes almost every day, but I've been wondering about that too, the status of Drupal console. It hasn't worked for me in ages. Okay, so looks like there's a release 19 days ago, but yeah, I think that that might be an issue if it's still. Let's see. Yeah, so currently it's going to pull in well three or four of these versions of Symphony. So Drupal nine is is requiring four, then that should be okay. Because so if this if we didn't have this this or at the at the end here, then then there would be a problem. Mm, I don't sure. know whether that's made it into an actual release yet or not. Any final questions for Oliver? OK. Well, let's give Oliver a round of applause. Oliver, thank you very much for sharing with us. Cool. Thanks again for having me. It's been, um, yeah, thanks again for yeah, just having me hang out in your meetups the last few months. It's been great. And um, yeah, thanks again. Glad to Sorry have you. <laughs> Sorry for the tech issues. Thanks for putting up with our time zone. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to follow some of Michael's suggestions now and go grab some sleep. Yeah, <laughs> well deserved. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to share our uh, slide deck again here. OK, there it is. So our next meetup is the first Wednesday of October, October 7th. And uh, you can RSVP now at bit.ly slash dnyc10. 20 for October 2020. Um, definitely encourage you to do that so you don't forget and you don't miss out. Um, and uh, let's see, what do we have next? Well, next meetup, uh, we are doing a lightning talk meetup. So all of our talks in October will be lightning talks. So short talks, five to 10 minutes each. Um, and this is our current lineup. We've got one, two, three, four talks lined up already. Um, but we would love to have uh, you, you, or you present as well. Um, so if you're interested uh, in presenting, we would we would love to hear from you. Uh, it can be on any topic of potential interest to people using, learning, or as I said, hating Drupal. Um, yeah, so speak at drupalnyc.org is uh, the best place to, uh, to reach out uh, to coordinate uh, getting a talk scheduled. And uh, here's my darling Ramona uh, about a year ago. <laughs> and uh, in a few minutes, maybe I'll, I'll bring her on here. Um, yeah, so that is our, our scheduled, the scheduled portion of our meetup. Um, so now in, uh, in true Drupal NYC fashion, uh, it's time for our chaotic uh, happy hour here uh, online. I'm going to turn off the recording here. Um, thank you all for coming. I just have to find the off button. There we are. <laughs>